Hi, Chris. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. I can see you and hear you. You look great. Good. Good. Okay. I think that um, people did, in fact, get to hear my introduction of you. So I will save them me repeating it. Tech guys, are you happy and good for us to go ahead? Yes. Okay. Looks like we're fine. Okay, Chris. Here's what I'd like to start with. I was recently watching a video that someone had uploaded of you that was titled the best video of 2017, everyone must watch. That was literally what the title of the video was. And in it, you were incredibly succinctly describing in a very holistic way, the current human experience in all facets of life and existence. And you were doing it just and I feel like people are so inundated from, you know, we are under so many pressures from everywhere, from the media, from economics and poverty to the environmental issues. And somehow you managed to bring that all together and explain to us exactly the position that we're in. And I was wondering if you could do that again now for, for the people who are joining us on the stream who haven't had the benefit of, of seeing this. What has happened to planet Earth and where are we right now? It, it, well, we have uh, unleashed the destructive forces of capitalism without restraint, and capitalism is doing what it's designed to do, which is commodify everything. Human beings are commodities, the natural world is a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And in the, the power of corporations to essentially pillage, loot, and destroy uh, both the ecosystem and the nation state uh, was uh, put into place over the last few decades uh, by creating systems of political paralysis, in essence, where uh, by seizing all of the mechanisms of government, all of the institutions that once made piecemeal and incremental reform possible, uh, and then diverting all of those mechanisms towards the further empowerment and enrichment of the corporate state and the global oligarchic elite, um, government no longer uh, responded in any rational or meaningful way to the vast majority of the citizenry that it increasingly not only impoverished, but repressed uh, by eviscerating privacy, uh, abolishing due process, um, in the United States in particular, militarizing police so that they use lethal and discriminant force against unarmed citizens, primarily citizens of color, putting in place uh, as a form of social control, the most monstrous system of mass incarceration in the world. We have 5%, we are 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prison population. Most of those people are poor people of color in from these de-industrialized zones where they're forced because there are no jobs into the illegal economy. Uh, poverty, in essence, is criminalized. Uh, police in these marginal communities carry out what can only be called reigns of terror. Uh, and uh, we can't forget about eviction. So you lock up the men and you evict the, the women and the mothers and children. And by evicting people every few months because they can't pay the rent, uh, you destabilize, you further destabilize the community. All of this is by design. Um, and it, it's very, has proven to be extremely dangerous uh, because when you uh, eradicate rights for a segment of your population, Hannah Arendt writes about this in The Origins of Totalitarianism about the stateless, she herself being stripped of her German citizenship and being stateless, then rights in essence become privileges uh, which can be taken away from everyone. And so as we stood by, as these marginal communities uh, were turned into kind of quasi-militarized totalitarian states, 
uh, the assault that began with the poorest and primarily African Americans and Latinos, people of color, uh, is now being extended to the rest of us. Uh, and uh, we will have another financial crash eventually. I don't know when, but we're certainly headed in that direction. But as Nomi Prinz and Rick Wolf and other economists have pointed out, there's no plan B. There's no, uh, they can't reduce interest rates any more than they've reduced them when they're virtually at zero. Uh, U.S. Treasury bonds will be worthless. Um, and we're reaching that point when the dollar will no longer be the reserve currency, uh, which will send the U.S. economy into freefall. So uh, at that point, they already have the legal and the physical mechanisms to create a very frightening form of tyranny. Uh, one of, I wanna speak to the issue of what, of Julian's work and WikiLeaks and why it's so important. Uh, because, and I speak as a former investigative journalist for the New York Times. The, uh, the problem is that with wholesale surveillance, traditional forms of journalism have been uh, locked out of examining the centers of power. It, it is the job in a functioning society, in an open society, for the press to shine a light on the inner workings of power. Um, but because uh, of wholesale surveillance, because they have everyone's phone records, email records, they just seized all of these records of a New York Times reporter. Uh, and, uh, and of course we have our tracking devices we carry around on their behalf 24 hours a day. So uh, what does that mean? It means that, uh, those colleagues of mine who still work at the New York Times, they, they can't, they don't, they cannot write about what's happening inside uh, the machinery of the state. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's often overlooked that Obama's was, was worse than George W. Bush in terms of uh, not only uh, civil liberties, but in terms of shutting down whistleblowers. He used the Espionage Act including against Snowden, I think nine times uh, up until uh, he, he took office in 2009, between 1917 when it was written and 2009, it was used three times, uh, once against Daniel Ellsberg. But the Espionage Act is the equivalent of uh, the British Foreign Secrets Act. It, it was designed uh, to prosecute people who handed uh, sensitive secret information over to a hostile power. Um, and Obama really misused it to go after whistleblowers ruthlessly. And there were very public cases and there were some cases that were never made public. Um, but the result was that the uh, traditional press could no longer write about the deep, what we call the deep state, the security and surveillance state, uh, the acts of uh, malfeasance and crimes that were being committed by the state. Remember it was Obama as well that I would argue misinterpreted the 2000 uh, and uh, to authorization to use military force act as giving the executive branch the right to assassinate American citizens, which they did in Yemen with the radical cleric Anwar al -Laki, and we should add his 16 year old son. Um, and so uh, the last readout of uh, an open society was really uh, uh, by default, uh, put into the hands of people who could hack into these systems. Uh, um, Jeremy Hammond, who uh, released 5 million emails from the private security firm uh, Stratford. Th this was a very important moment for me personally, because when those emails came out, <clears throat> I was in the process of suing uh, Barack Obama in federal court over Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, Section 1021 of the National Defense Authorization Act uh, overturns the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act, which uh, had prohibited the US military from acting as a domestic police force. And uh, I sued him in the Southern District Court of New York. Um, and in that trial, we used what uh, Jeremy Hammond had uncovered, which was a back and forth between this private security company and federal officials attempting to tie a group called U.S. Days of Rage, which was about election reform, to a terrorist group. It, it, they said, is there any jihadist website that has reprinted 
any of these messages so that we can charge them under terrorism laws. And uh, it, was, it was one of the pieces that led to our victory uh, uh, and the issuing of a temporary injunction by the judge. Now, unfortunately, of course, what happened uh, as soon as she issued the injunction and she wrote a 112 page opinion where she uh, quite correctly said that this opens the way for the government to criminalize an entire group of people. And she talked about the internment of 110,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, what happened was the day she issued a ruling, uh, lawyers from the National Security Agency uh, showed up at her chambers and demanded that she lift the injunction uh, uh, immediately in the name of national security. To her credit, this is Judge Catherine before she refused. That was a Friday, Monday morning at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, they were in the Second Circuit, which is in the American system, the court above uh, the uh, district, federal district court, uh, and demanded that this injunction be lifted in the name of national security, which unfortunately the Second Circuit did lift. Why? Uh, and, and I think that the, you know, the assumption on my part and the part of the lawyers, Bruce Afron and Carl Mayer, was that uh, uh, it's because in some black site somewhere there already are American citizens, uh, and this injunction would make them in violation of, uh, you, you know, of law. If the guy ever got out and could get a lawyer, um, you could. I mean, our court system is pretty dysfunctional and about to become even more dysfunctional. Um, but in theory, you, you could prosecute, you could defend yourself against um, unwarranted uh, seizure and detention. Um, also, so, just say it's possible that those American citizens and those black sites may in fact be on US soil, given what we know about the Chicago PD black sites and yeah, other the way that- Yeah, that was operate. actually run by the Chicago Police Department. Um, yes, they could be, uh, they very well could be. Um, you know, th this is the problem when when the state essentially uh, creates a, or builds a kind of wall or a veil around its activities, uh, then there's no check, there's no control. Uh, and, and this is of course the importance of what uh, people like Julian and WikiLeaks did is that they uh, provided to the American public a glimpse of how what these power systems were doing and 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 how they were functioning uh and and this of course uh was because uh those of us in the traditional media i'm kind of julia i when i visit julia and he makes fun of my computer illiteracy um uh we can't do it i don't have the skills in that sense i'm not a threat to them at all um but those who have the uh, technological skills to break through their barriers, that's why they persecute them, hound them, follow them, uh, and fear them. Um, because it's, it's the final, uh, it, it's the, the, the only mechanism we have left uh, to make these people accountable. And that's why they are so vicious in terms of, of course, the long campaign of character assassination. And, uh, and the draconian sentences, Hammond was sentenced to 10 years. Uh, I was in the courtroom when he was sent. I visited him in jail before he was uh, sentenced and then was in the courtroom when he was sentenced. So uh, it's why Snowden fled the country. Snowden realized quite well that um, uh, his two choices were probably life in prison or uh, exile and well, he had hoped Ecuador and he ended up in Russia. And that um, that may actually have turned out to be for the better, considering the current situation in Ecuador, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I just want to take it back to the intro there. The reason I asked you, you know, what is the situation that we're in? And, and you've answered and said that this chaos is by design. Um, what I'd like to know is for the, uh, what is the end game of the architects of that chaos by design? And then in what way does WikiLeaks really throw a spanner into their works. Why is it that the that WikiLeaks is such a threat that the director of the CIA would use his first press conference to attack WikiLeaks? Well, because WikiLeaks is the last mechanism 
by which the wider public can see what these people's intentions are and what they're doing. Um, that used to be, I mean, I, I, in tradition, I worked for the New York Times for 15 years. I published classified information on the front pages of the New York Times that was leaked to me, you know, the old way, in a report or uh, in, in a cable or something like that. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't work anymore <clears throat> because they instantly uh, know who communicates with reporters and who doesn't. Um, and so they were the ones who shut down that process. Uh, what is their end goal? You know, they don't really know. Um, they don't think that far ahead. Um, they are driven by a kind of mania for profit. I'm talking about the large corporations, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, the fossil fuel industry, um, because what they're doing, if they stopped rationally to think about it, is suicidal for the planet and ultimately for themselves. And they will retreat to their gated communities and perhaps live a little longer than the rest of us. But it's, it doesn't make any sense from a rational standpoint. Uh, it's, a, it's like the wars in, in, in the Middle East. They, they, and I, I spent seven years in the Middle East. Uh, I think, as you said in the introduction, I was the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times. I'm an Arabic speaker. It, it never made any sense. It was utter folly. Uh, you know, I, I use the word, I call them, I call people like Dick Cheney utopians, but that going back to the way Thomas More coined the word utopia, which means no place. They're not grounded in the real world. I mean, the idea that uh, invading Iraq would see uh, democracy implanted in Baghdad and spread outwards across the Middle East and that Bathus uh, would greet us as liberators and the oil revenues would pay for the reconstruction. And this is no place. This isn't real. This isn't, uh, they, they have uh, like, you know, many kind of stunted uh, uh, chauvinists who dominate the American empire. Uh, they, they don't, um, they don't really understand the world around them. Um, and that's why they're so dangerous. And of course, Trump, as I've often said, is, is a symptom. He, he's not the disease. Trump is what a decayed, dysfunctional system vomits up in the same way that with the breakdown of the former Yugoslavia, I covered the war there for the New York Times, uh, it vomited up these figures like Radovan Karadzic or Slobodan Milosevic or Fran Yotushman. Or if you go back to Weimar, it's the same. Um, and, and, you know, the Democratic Party in the United States, unfortunately, has, you know, we, we have this kind of Russia hysteria, of which I'm a victim, of course. Um, but it is a way to deny the reality. And that is that the elites, the ruling elites in both the Republican and the Democratic Party establishment, as well as, of course, the, the, the corporate establishment, betrayed most of the population. Uh, we have the um, most disproportionate uh, income inequality since going all the way back to uh, the age of the robber barons with Carnegie and Rockefeller. Um, and, uh, and Trump just made it worse. I mean, we just gave these massive corporate tax cuts. And what do they do? They, they don't invest. Uh, they don't provide jobs. They buy back their stock or they hoard it. Uh, because if they buy back their stock, it sends the price up and the, the people who manage this, these companies make a killing uh, and insane amounts of money. I mean, you know, billions of dollars. Um, so uh, the whole system is collapsing. Um, and the country is both morally and physically degenerating. I, I have a book coming out in August. I spent the last two years on it. It's called America. The farewell tour, and it 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 looks at these pathologies um, as the inevitable result of a society in precipitous decline. Um, and it, 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 Durkheim did this with his great book on suicide. Um, but but the idea that uh, you know treating drug addicts and clinics. You're not dealing with the root of the problem. You're not dealing with the despair, the hopelessness, the frustration, the pain that drives people into uh, gambling, into suicides, uh, into these hate groups. And I spent a lot of time with white hate groups 
you know, right wing militia type, the old uh, Knights of the All Right, Proud Boys, Three Percenters, etc. Um, uh, the sexual sadism that is now endemic within the culture. Uh, this is what happens in any society that uh, is dying. Um, and I studied classics at Harvard. So it's, it's uh, you know, very familiar for anybody who's read the final chapter of the Roman Empire, but the Greek Empire also. I mean, the Greek Empire overreached by invading Sicily, lost its entire fleet, most of its soldiers, and, uh, and the empire disintegrated in the same way that the British Empire overreached in 1956 when it invaded Suez. I mean, that's what empires do at the end. Uh, it's called micro-militarism. That's the term for it. But that's is this what, what we see. Is this what we see with the a warmongering towards Russia? Do you think this is a no? It's what we what we saw in two thousand and three. With no, we have ah. seventeen years of war, mm -hmm. and, and what what do we have from it? Uh, I mean, the arms industry has made a killing, uh, but the Taliban controls seventy percent of Afghanistan. Iraq is will never come back as a unified country. We have littered the region from Libya, Libya to Syria to Yemen through our Saudi proxies with failed states. We've fueled, and not only fueled, but frankly armed, uh, these jihadist groups, Al-Qaeda, Nusra, ISIS, etc. cetera. Um, it's utter folly. It, it has no, it's, it's and there's no. Um, and yet they're continuing to push. I mean, we've just seen. Right. Rudy Giuliani and up to 100,000 people in Europe calling for regime change in Iran. Right. Well, I mean, let's be clear about why, why they're going after Iran. It's because they're trying to divert attention from uh, the mess that they've made. So Iran becomes the scapegoat. Iran becomes, and, you know, Iran is, uh, is a big country. <laughs> uh, and I think what I'll, I speak as someone who, of course, covered Iran, the if you attack Iran within the region, it, it will be interpreted as an attack on Shiism. And 60% of Iraq is Shia. Uh, three to four million Shia in Saudi Arabia, most of them live in the oil fields, Bahrain, etc. cetera. So, um, but these people really don't, uh, and that's what's so frightening about them because they have the tremendous power to inflict uh, great damage, which they have done, but they're incredibly ignorant. Uh, about the world around them. And now we have seen under the Trump administration uh, the disemboweling of the di diplomatic corps of the State Department. Uh, and uh, he speaks e exclusively in the language of coercion, threat, force. Um, but I think these people don't have, they certainly don't have a realistic vision of what they want to accomplish, but I, I sense that they don't, they don't even think that far ahead. Um, and, and that's often, you know, that kind of myopia is often very characteristic of the late stages of empire. If you look at the end of the Roman empire, I mean, it, it doesn't, it, the decline. So, you know, you get, uh, you know, a, a Caligula or Nero, and then you might get a Hadrian. I mean, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it, 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 it had bumps along the way. Um, but Trump, reminds me very much of the Roman Empire Commodius, who used to stage fights with himself as the victor uh, in the arena. I mean, uh, just utter narcissism, utter self-obsession, obsession, and also utter and complete incompetence. Um, he was finally killed by the Praetorian Guard. Um, but Trump is, I mean, Trump is burlesque, but dangerous. Um, he reminds me of Ceausescu. I covered Ceausescu. It was also kind of uh, suffered from that megalomania and idiocy, very poorly educated, uh, but they can do a lot of damage. I mean, they will do a lot of damage uh, when there's no check, there's no control. So what does Trump do? He comes into power and the first thing he does is give the military carte blanche to run their wars around uh, the empire without any kind of civilian oversight or control. And then he gives them a 10% military increase, which they didn't even ask for. Uh, and then he goes to the corporate, well, to Wall Street, into the corporate sector and gives them these insane tax cuts, which are, um, you know, very uh, destructive to the health of the economy. Uh, 
And then he, he goes to the fossil fuel industry and strips down whatever regulations we just lost Scott Pruitt, but it doesn't make any difference, whatever regulations he can. So they all find him embarrassing. How can you not find him embarrassing? I'm sure even Melania Trump finds him embarrassing. But uh, because he has given them uh, what, what they want in the same way that he has filled his ideological vacuum, he doesn't believe anything. He doesn't even have the capacity to build a belief system. But that vacuum is being filled by the Christian right, who are Christian fascists. Uh, and you will now watch him build a Supreme Court that will uh, do things like overturn Roe versus Wade, Roe v. Wade, uh, which will outlaw abortion. Well, out, abortion, of course, we know is never outlawed. It just means the rich, uh, you know, get safe abortions and people who can't afford uh, to pay for clandestine abortions die in back rooms. Uh, so. Um, these sectors, he whether it's, you know, I, I don't know whether he, you know, how aware he is, but he has essentially placated those forces within the corporate apparatus that might have stopped him. Um, yes, he's waging war with, you know, the FBI, uh, but this is more about control. Um, and, you know, any despot, their final battle is always with the uh bureaucracy, with the state bureaucracy, uh, with public, professional public servants, uh, and they replace them with people who, uh, whose loyalty is exclusively to the leader. I mean, that's what we're watching um, happen. Uh, and I mean, God help us, you know, in a day when uh, the, the institution that, you know, supposedly fighting on our behalf is the FBI. Um, so that, that's the process and, and it, it, it will be, um, accelerated immensely at, at a, with economic, with an economic crisis. And, and then things here will become very, very frightening, very, very fast. So where do the intelligence agencies fit into this? Because it is the intelligence agencies who are out for WikiLeaks and Julian Assange's blood. It is the intelligence agencies who have likewise been rightly, in my opinion, targeted by WikiLeaks and by Julian Assange. Um, I've studied Snowden files extensively in those files. The intelligence agencies are absolutely obsessed with strategic control and strategic planning. They want to be able to influence their uh, development, the strategic development of technology itself in the commercial sector. They want to be able to influence all facets of human existence and, and they go to great lengths to do so decades in advance. But we also know that the intelligence agencies create product which they serve to customers. And we know that the customers of the NSA, for example, include not just government departments, but the Federal Reserve Bank of America, for example, is a private institution which is a customer of the NSA. Now, we are told by the media that the intelligence agencies are in opposition to Trump. We have, um, you know, Brennan and various other voices from the intelligence agencies, you know, heads of the recent past, um, out there speaking out very openly and overtly against Trump. Is this just a sideshow? Is it an exercise in mass destruction? Or is there really, do you think, conflict between these the agencies and the administration? No, I, the conflict is real, but it, it's not over Trump's policies. It's the fact that he, as an individual, is so destructive to the alliance and to the, uh, the, the global perception of the United States. Uh, he, they recognize that he's uh, a very negative force. Uh, you know, he insults the Prime Minister of Canada. Who doesn't insult? Merkel. Uh, he is destroying that apparatus that the deep state relies on for both domestic and international control, largely because he's stupid. Uh, and so that, that so the, the uh, the, the anger is real, um, it, it, but it's not over policies. It's not like Trump is going to restore privacy or uh, you know, stop militarized drone attacks against wedding parties in Afghanistan. He ain't gonna do any of that. Um, it, it's the fact that you know, the United States has become the, the, and rightly so, the kind of laughing stock. Reminds me of Orwell's essay, Shooting an Elephant, where he, 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 he was a Burmese policeman for five years, uh, 
uh, and he talks about a rampaging elephant and he has to go out and shoot it and he doesn't want to shoot it. And then he just starts reflecting on the whole role of the white colonial colonizer is not to be laughed at. <laughs> um, and they're laughing at us. And that's, that's what it's about. And, and I mean, all, more than laughing. I mean, he really is um, damaging traditional alliances that are extremely important for the empire. But but not not on purpose, just because he's Trump. So in the context of what's happening to Julian at the moment, we have a Western journalist a, um, sitting in a Western country um, with in front of the world, really, despite the fact he's been cut off from it in terms of communications. He really is sitting there in front of the world. And we are seeing a Western power um, restrict, you know, re refuse him access to medical treatment, um, refuse him all of his basic human rights, refuse to comply with uh, UN rulings, which have said that, yes, he is being arbitrarily detained. Uh, do you, This seems to take the mask off the empire, you know, the, the empire that claims it's all about human rights and, and will even launch invasions to enforce those human rights is depriving a publisher and a journalist of those human rights in, in front of the world. Um, is this going to change anything? Uh, uh, do you feel that they are exposing themselves in, uh, through this hypocrisy is really what well, I'm I, I think they've pretty well exposed. I mean, uh, you know, l let's remember we are the country that perpetrated the torture at Abu Ghraib. Um, no, everyone in the Middle East, there's no mystery about who we really are and how much we care about human rights. Um, they have, I mean, you talked about it before, and you're right, that there is a, a fierce within these systems, uh, an almost maniacal hatred of Julian and WikiLeaks. And in their eyes, they have to get him and they have to make an example of him so there won't be any more Julian Assange's. That's what this and is about. I agree, but also they really have failed to, to meaningfully do so for eight years now, and it must be an ongoing embarrassment to them that WikiLeaks has even managed to resist for as long as they have. Yeah, well, that's only angered them, <laughs> angered them even more, uh, and they never forget. Um, they will wait and wait and wait, and... Um, you, you can be certain they are using every lever they have on the Ecuadorian government. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I Absolutely. mean, this is, a, this is a, a, you know, it, and this goes beyond WikiLeaks or beyond Julian, but it gets back to what I mentioned before, is that the, the point of vulnerability they have are, are those who have the skills to hack into the system and expose what they're doing. And so the ferocity of their soul, they don't, they don't like me, but, you know, I, I'm relatively harmless by comparison. The ferocity of the assault is directed at, at those who have the skills to show the world who they are. And, and so they must make an example of him in their eyes. That's what they're doing. In the U.S. military counterinsurgency doctrine, they have a figure, and the figure is of a house, a building, a structure, and it has three pillars, and then it has uh, the foundation of the structure. And the pillars are the economic pillar, the me methods of economic control, the police, the security state pillar, the, the might, the military force is the second pillar. The third pillar is the government, the, the veneer of politics that is supposed to be in control of everything, but as we know, really isn't when it comes down to it. The foundation of the structure is information. And it is the, this is something they use offensively when they want to destabilize a country. They say you can take down the government, but the banking and financial institutions and the military and police institutions will be able to maintain control while they restore the governmental pillar. Likewise, you can take down the security forces like we saw they did in Iraq. Um, and the economic powers and, and the political powers can, can still maintain control. Likewise, if you if you have an economic crash, the military forces and the government can still maintain control. But when you pollute or manipulate that foundation of information um, and when you can reach people at a mass level, you can simultaneously destabilize those three pillars and the structure can fall down. 
And I see WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, what they are doing is they are attacking that foundation. And that that uh, risks destabilization of all of these malignant forces that are sitting on top of that. And in some ways, I think they're turning that counterinsurgency doctrine back upon those who've been uh, using it with devastating results, you know, around the world for decades and generations. Right. Well, well and, and they're doing it in the classic, uh, the classic method, which is to tar WikiLeaks and or dissenters like myself as being agents of a foreign power. So we have the whole Russia hysteria here, which is a smokescreen and fictitious, but which the corporate media uh, can't spend enough time hyperventilating about uh, because the elites do not want to acknowledge that it's social inequality, which they engineered. Uh, which has created this loss of faith in the ruling ideology of uh, global capitalism or neoliberalism. Uh, people aren't buying it. It doesn't matter what their political uh, persuasion is. They're not buying it anymore on the left or the right. So therefore, critics like myself, which have already been pushed to the margins of the internet, are being targeted. So I write a column every Monday for Truth Dig. And uh, first we saw this anonymous, well, you know, it's anonymous, we can guess who put it out, this anonymous website called Prop or Not, Propaganda mm. or Not, then uh, accused left-wing sites like Truthdig and World Socialist Website and Consortium News and Alternate, et cetera. Uh, any, any place where an anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist might have a voice of being, uh, used by the Russian government, which is ridiculous. I mean, if you, there, you know, you couldn't find any factual basis for that at all on, uh, on, on my site and on most of these sites, I think all of these sites. So, but, and then the Washington Post runs this on the front page, the lawyers from Truth to contact the Post and the Post tells them, well, we know who they are, but we can't tell you who they are, um, but you can contact them to see if you can get your name off the list. So you have an anonymous group making uh, uh, a false charge um, who you don't know who they are and you're, I mean, it's crazy. And so then in response to that, you have Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, they impose these algorithms which have devastated traffic to left-wing sites. So they're called impressions. Somebody told me that because I don't know anything about the internet. That's but, correct. Right, impressions okay, meaning me every time I'm wrong. instances of people able to view the content. Correct. Right. So you had, if you typed in imperialism, and I'd written a column on imperialism before the impressions were fixed in the algorithms, my article would come up along with other articles. Now it, you get diverted to a mainstream site like the Washington Post. Um, and, and we have a graph over the last year that the referrals uh, like that through these impressions have declined from over 700,000 now to below 200,000 because they keep playing with the algorithms to make them more effective. Then you get the abolition of net neutrality, which will further, uh, by tiering the internet, make these kinds of sites harder to get to. Uh, and then you have the attack on RT. I have a program on RT called On Contact. And I'm on RT because I can't get on anywhere else. I mean, in a functioning system of public broadcasting, if we had one, I mean, I'm, I can get on the CBC, I can get Radio France, but I can't get on anything here. Uh, you go back to the 60s and you could see Malcolm X and James Baldwin and Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn on public broadcasting, which is why you should have public broadcasting. So people who aren't bought and paid for have a voice. Uh, and so they start attacking RT. But it's fascinating when you read the director of national intelligence report, uh, which they put out with seven pages of it are dedicated to RT. They, they expose totally why they hate RT America. And it's nothing to do with Russia. And they say it. It's all it's in the report. You can read it. It's because they give a voice to third party candidates, because they give a voice to Black Lives Matter, because they give a voice to anti fracking act. These are word, their words, not mine. And 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 the elites are astute enough to realize that nobody's buying their shit anymore. And they and so therefore they don't really have a counter argument to their critics, 
And so their critics have to be silenced. And the way they're going to do it, and they're using the same technique to go after WikiLeaks, is by saying that we all work for Vladimir Putin. We're all uh, agents of a foreign power. We're, tra- in essence, traitors uh, and have to be silenced. And I think what's so disturbing in the United States is watching the quote unquote left. I mean, that's another hour of discussion, whether we even have one. <laughs> but they just, they swallow it completely. I mean, MSNBC, which is of course corporate owned, can't pump out people like Rachel, Ma- Rachel Maddow. They can't pump out this Russian stuff fast enough. Uh, but it's a diversion. It's a smokescreen. It's a trick. And it's used to mask the reality of what's happening and to shut down the voices of dissenters, including, of course, dissenters like Julian Assange. And they've already done a pretty effective, uh, they've mounted a very effective campaign of character assassination against him. Uh, And, you know, I don't know. And yet, and yet, when WikiLeaks makes a release, they're still able to set the international news agenda. When Julian decided that he wanted to speak about the Catalan situation, you know, he does so with so incredible impact. And you're absolutely correct. And not you said you weren't very technologically savvy, but you described very well the situation about the algorithms and net neutrality. Well, that's because other people have told me what to say. <laughs> Well, you should take heart in the fact that you're correct that all of these methods of technological oppression and technological censorship have been applied. But I tell you what, if we go to CNN's YouTube channel right now, they'll be lucky if they have 10% of the hits of one Jimmy Dore show on their videos. And that should, that I think is another factor is that even though they are doing all of these things, using all these methods to suppress the content, the people's thirst for the content is leading them to the source. That's very, well, that's very true. And that's why they've imposed these algorithms and that's why they've abolished net neutrality. And that's why they are attempting this character assassination against dissidents because before when people were buying their mythical version of uh, you know, the, the way upwards to a global utopia written ad nauseum by people like Thomas Friedman, people like us were a nuisance. Now, now we're a threat. Absolutely. But yeah, you know, what I'm trying to say is I don't think that they're achieving the goal, even though they are throwing so much money at it and th- so much technology at it. Still, people um, are turning away from it. It's, it's not working. You know, the MSM audience is not growing. It's declining. Right. That's all that's true, which is why they intend to get a lot harsher. You're very right. And um That ties us back to what Dan Ellsberg said, actually, because when I interviewed Dan Ellsberg uh, last night on the stream, he said he believes the reason that they are so voraciously going after Julian is not just the hundred reasons that they already have to hate him, but that they are fully intending to set a precedent, a legal precedent, where they extradite him, they prosecute him, and they jail him, and that that precedent will become the first instance that is then repeated time and time again and and used as a baton against publishing as a whole and, and journalism. Right. And let 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 us not let publications like the New York Times and The Guardian and Der Spiegel who published all this stuff get away. I mean, why, you know, they've they've really thrown Julian under the bus here. They they took his material, they ran it. Uh, and they ran it because if they didn't run it, it would have been embarrassing for them. Um, th- he functioned in the same role that they did, which is as a publisher, and uh, and they've they've betrayed him. Uh, you know, really, that that's one of the you know sorriest kind of commentaries on the state of Western journalism that they have been so. Um, duplicitous in this particular case. Do you see, like Dan saying this, the persecution of Julian will become the precedent, do you see realistically that the New York Times, the Guardian, these um, lofty organisations which don't see fit to, to advocate for Julian at this time, do you really think that they, their feet will truly be held to the fire legally in, in the time to come? Well, I mean, history has shown <laughs> Julian's where they start, you know, WikiLeaks is where they start. And these people are, uh, you know, very misguided if they think that WikiLeaks is where they'll stop. 
Well, in that sense, I hope that they wake up and grow a backbone and maybe start to understand that WikiLeaks is the bulwark. WikiLeaks is actually Julian himself had called it the vanguard. It was considered quite controversial and um, when he used vanguardism. In independent media and as an activist, I myself certainly have felt that WikiLeaks has generated a space for us all to operate yeah. in as yeah. they've taken that heat. They've pushed so far out and they've they've held the wall and taken the heat from the agencies. We know there's over at least, I mean, this is really two years out of date, at least 800 full-time members of the intelligence agencies working on active actively suppressing and destroying WikiLeaks. Right. And I, I have often asked the question, you know, those those 800 employees, if WikiLeaks are taken down, they're not going to be fired. They're not going to resign. They're going to be reassigned. And that's where right. where are they going to be reassigned to? That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an old story. And, and by the time these institutions traditional media institutions wake up, it'll probably be too late. Well, I certainly hope not. I hope that my my humble hope is that um, we started this series with a 10-hour vigil and, and 15 people. We last month had a 26-hour vigil. We this month are having a 38-hour vigil. We planned for a 50-hour vigil next month. And I'm hoping that we can snowball um, these events, not just specifically this online vigil series, but that we can see increasing amounts of decentralized action in support of Julian and in support of WikiLeaks. Do you have any insight? I'm particularly interested being a New Zealander and because this is many of my um, friends and fellow activists in New Zealand who I look up to, we're a part of the free Mandela movement of the 80s as well as other significant anti-nuclear movements and whatnot. Um, can you, do you have any particular insight into the way that the Free Mandela movement built and became successful as a mass movement? Because I know it was 15 years in the planning and eight years in the execution before they finally actually achieved their aim. Uh, I wasn't in the United States then. You know, I was 20 years overseas. So during that, I wasn't here. But I am involved with the boycott and divestment sanction movement in the United States. And... Um, you really build it university by university. It's why the Israeli lobby is now going, you know, banning students for justice in Palestine groups at individual universities uh, with the same kind of, it's, it's fascinating that when they shut them down, it, it looks like a script that's been handed to the administration, of course, by wealthy Zionist donors. Uh, and these students are not, not only are these groups abolished, but the students are prohibited from having any leadership position, if it's even if it's a position that has nothing to do with Israel. So students on the student council are removed and not allowed to be in the student council again. Um, so uh, I think it's I think looking at the BDS movement and from what I know of the anti-apartheid movement, it really does begin around your particular institution, and it grows from there. And you can see the Israelis are quite frightened buy it. Um, and let me just, I, I just have one New Zealand connection. My <laughs> photographer, Wade Goddard, was from Lower Hutt, where you're probably the only, the only person I've ever met who knows where that is. I definitely know where it is. He, he was an amazing guy. He is an amazing guy. He was a great photographer. And we covered the war in Bosnia and then Kosovo together. Our tech director from Internet Party. He, from called, Lower, he called Lower me Brucey. Is that a New Zealand term? I don't know yeah, where it's, that it's pretty typical. Yes, you would hear someone <laughs> called Brucey in New Zealand. That's very, okay. very true. Um, I'm I'm really interested in any movement where they have a single aim, they uh, are a mass movement, they, re they reach the vast majority of the public and they actually achieve that aim. We had two mass movements in New Zealand that I was involved with where we did get 90% saturation in terms of breaking, getting the information through the public. We did force the mass media into a position where they had to cover it, but um, we were let down at the governmental level as they simply basically raised their middle finger to us and refused to implement the reform. Um, I think Julian is uh, synonymous with Mandela. Uh, for, they're obviously different for many reasons, but they both um, received the Medal of Freedom actually together. Um, and I think that we can build, we can use the Mandela movement as a as a template for um, for Julian and achieving freedom for him. I hope I think it, has to, it probably has to start at the university level. We have to begin to build at that level. And um, the un and the unions as well. I, I uh, think we don't we don't have much of unions anymore in the United uh, States. But yeah, 
in New Zealand, our activism is very much still driven by the unions, though we've had similar privatisation agendas and de-unionisation de agendas. We we still have that core grassroots activism spirit is very so much a part of our yeah, heritage. Yeah, I, I think that's smart. Okay, so Chris, I just want to quickly, just to wrap this up, I'd like to read for you the public statements that you made um, on June 7th about Julian. They were very gratefully received in whistleblower circles. So I've got here, and I think this is in sequential order. You said Julian Assange's life is in danger. This is a mortal risk. In violation of his fundamental human rights, the Ecuadorian government has transformed his asylum in its London embassy into a form of brutal incarceration. It has cut off his access to the internet, thus depriving Julian of the ability to communicate with his supporters or even to follow world events. The transparent aim of this inhuman treatment is to force Julian to leave the Ecuadorian embassy so that he can be seized by London police thrown into a British jail and endure deportation proceedings, which will be rigged to ensure a predetermined outcome. Julian Assange will be turned over to the United States and delivered into the hands of Donald Trump, Mike Pompeo, James Bolton, and the CIA's expert torturer in chief, Gina Haspel. Julian Assange is a courageous journalist. He has been victimized because he exposed the real crimes of imperialism. The conspiracy against Julian must be stopped. His defense is the cutting edge of the fight against government suppression of the most fundamental democratic rights. I, being you, therefore support the June 17 demonstration in Sydney called by the Australian Socialist Equality Party, which is demanding that the Australian government afford Julian the protection to which he is entitled as a citizen of Australia. The Turnbull government must take action to stop Julian's illegal persecution by the British, American and Ecuadorian governments and secure his safe return to Australia. Now, since you made that statement, actually, we had the Australian High Commissioner for the first time ever actually show up at the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, and we've also seen the first mass actions across more than a dozen cities around the world, coordinated actions in support of Julian Assange. So I'd like your feedback since making those statements. And I'm also interested to know why you think that returning Julian to Australia would be more beneficial. Well, because he has zero chance of getting a fair trial in the United States. He's, he's going to be lynched. He's going to be railroaded. It's all predetermined. Um, and the only hope is that we get him out of the clutches of the British uh, system, which is the handmaiden of the American system, uh, if there's any hope that he's uh, going to be able to be free, I think it's really getting him to Australia. Um, he, you know, he he will at least be in a country where he has citizenship. Um, and uh, I, I think that we have to. I mean, as you pointed out, we have to, in every way that we can. Um, put pressure. Um, he, he's being, I mean, even the United Nations has acknowledged that he's, he's being held, his, his uh, uh, detention, which is really, in the end, the fault of the British government, uh, is uh, untenable and under, under international law. Uh, and, um, and so I think that you know, I, I hope that these demonstrations will continue. I think the pressure point is that we have to bring this issue uh, repeatedly before the Australian government and Australian officials, um, because I don't see any other uh, governmental body or national body that potentially would act in his defense. What do you think about people power? As a as a potential solution, is is it is it possible? Do you think? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, we got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about as an American. Uh, yeah, it, it's it. I mean, this is a great scene in Kissinger's memoirs. I've said this many times, but where it's 1971 or something, and then there are tens of thousands of anti-war demonstrators surrounding the White House, 
and, and Nixon has put empty city buses end to end around the White House. To, and he looks out the window and he says, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us. And that is exactly where we want people in power to be. Um, you know, politics is a game of fear. If they're not frightened of us, um, they'll, they'll steamroll us. Um, history has just shown that over and over and over. And so we have to build militant popular movements that don't get bought off, uh, that don't compromise, uh, and that pit power against power. And when we do that, we'll have a chance. I agree with you. And it is a, a very pleasant um, image that you just gave us of <laughs> the elite right. in the White House, you know, having their feet to the fire and feeling the fear for once rather than it being the other way around. Yep. And um, in terms of mass movements, this is precisely why we called this unity for Julian, is that in my experience, mass movements have to be inclusive. It's not possible to build a mass movement out of a niche ideology. Yeah. Ideology, ideology has to be set to the side and there has to be a single focus that we all can unite on no matter what our particular backgrounds um, or ideologies are. So yep. thank you so, so yeah, no, much. Thank you for doing it. Yeah, it's a okay. truly fantastic Christmas. I want you to give, I want you to give my best to Lower Hut. Uh, I will. Like I said, our tech director is from Lower Hut, so I have to ask, okay, all right, there you I go. Have to ask around about Brucey and <laughs> <laughs> see if someone knows him. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Right, thank you. Again, I'll, you can expect an email from me next month. Thank you okay, so much, thanks. Chris. Take okay, care. Yeah,